Okay, that's my quick background, right? I think I kind of specialize in customer or B2C focused products. Uh, I've worked in many different companies like Walmart. This is my second stint at Walmart Labs. I was part of the first, uh, you know, first 30 people who started uh, who were part of the Walmart Labs organization. Uh, I was driving personalization and marketing technology as part of my, my first stint. Uh, and then I worked at, you know, a few other companies. EB and Bell, I was setting up uh, an office here in Palo Alto called as the Beer Garage, uh, which basically working with VCs and startups. I uh, ran over 2,000 pilots with uh, various startups uh, during my stint of uh, almost three years. Uh, and then I've, I've been, I think I kind of personally uh, feel passionate and I kind of believe in being student for life, so I kind of try and do one thing every year, right? I try and take, uh, hone in my skills in one specific area every year, so. Okay, so I want to kind of introduce you Sam's Club. So for folks who don't know Sam's Club, think of it just like the bigger warehouse, membership-based warehouse retailer that we have here in the area, right? So think of a very similar setup. And I call it the biggest little startup, just like how Reno says, the biggest little city, is because we are a $54 billion company, but we sit within this massive uh, $500 billion company called Walmart. So we are roughly about 12%. So we're still the startup. We, you know, people treat us as startup, which is great. And we also often get more latitude to be more aggressive, to do more experiments, to kind of act like a startup in, in various ways. So if you see a lot of the products, like Scan and Go is a great example, right? We started Scan and Go as a mobile product, and I'll be talking about it almost three years back, uh, four years back. And then Walmart picked it up. They uh, they rolled out uh, Scan and Go, right? I know Anand, you, I worked with him back in the day. Um, and then, um, you know, Walmart picked it up, they rolled out uh, Scan and Go, and then, you know, they are basically, you know, either they, they've decided to pull back on it because of different reasons. But if you look at Sam's Club, we are actually moving forward full force with, with Scan and Go. So that's just one example, but we've kind of done that uh, with many different products. So, which is why we get the benefit of being the biggest company, but also being acting like a startup and having the mentality and being product-led, right? So, this is our mission. Uh, very simple, forget, you know, it's a pretty busy slide and a little bit of a, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, it's, it's kind of all over the place. But I, I would say that, you know, focus just on three things, right? I think we, you know, when our new CEO came in, uh, you know, he kind of said that, you know, we've kind of done different things over a period of time and now we are going to just focus on three things, which is people, product and digital. And when we say product here, it means the product that we are selling or the product management. Uh, it's the items, right? That's the better way of thinking about it. I think people, items and digital were the three focus, uh, focal points. Uh, and I'll kind of talk, and this is on the website, right? So you guys can go refer to it. I don't want to spend time here. But I think I, I want to kind of uh, set this context because my presentation is within the context of the triangle of people, product, and digital, and how, how does product management play a role in all of the three, right? Basically, you know, think of product management as a culture shift, you know, sitting, oscillating, sitting inside the triangle, you know, driving all the three changes. So here's a quick question. Think of all of these brands. They are, these are really iconic brands. Can you guys tell me what is one thing that they have in common? And in, from the context of me speaking here, any, any answers? They've been around for a while and they changed a lot. Okay. Anything else? Brand. Brand name. Okay. P2C yeah. products. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Well, HP. Yeah. yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so what I would say is, uh, if Sam's Club were, was a company on its own, if it was not part of Walmart, it would have been ahead of all of these companies as per Fortune 50. Because if we were a company of our own, we would have been. We are a 54 billion dollar company. We would have been uh, 53 or 54 in the Fortune uh, 50. We, would have, we are ahead of all of this in terms of revenue. Uh, so I just want to think about it because I think, you know, not many people know Sam's Club. So I just wanted to kind of paint the picture 
in terms of how big we are, right? If you take the, the shadows of Walmart away. So everything that we're talking about is at the scale of billions, you know, uh, if not more. Okay, so why product management? So I want to kind of start off setting the theme with what, what I call as product acceleration. You know, we started this, this is a framework which talks about being customer obsessed in, a, in the context of, and this, this is applicable both for B2B and B2C, right? Uh, but being in, uh, having uh, the obsession to kind of understand customers and their needs is I think very, very critical and it's central to what we do from a product management standpoint because as I said, you know, as product managers, we don't control any of the resources, right? But we still are accountable for the impact. And, and we have to be the empathizers or the agent of the customer within the company so that there's someone who's representing our customers. And I might you know, often be referring to customers as members because in Sam's Club context, we call them as members. So, you know, you can just use it interchangeably. So, we go with that. So, the idea is you always start with a customer need. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about what the framework is. So let me start with something very simple, right? So product acceleration is a forum or a framework that we, that we created almost three, three and a half years back when I was part of, and I joined Sam's Club. And what we do is to just to kind of, uh, you know, start with something very, very simple and tangible on the ground. It's a meeting that we run every Friday morning at 9 a.m., okay? So what we do is it's a joint frame, uh, framework kind of a model where everyone who is working on a, a particular customer, customer problem comes together, you know, right from the executives. And, and the, the context is everyone has a, the, the seat at the table. And we kind of talk about our product roadmap, our priorities, what is the problem you're trying to solve, what is the metric that we're trying to move, and what is the customer need that we're trying to solve, and how are we solving it, and where are we on that? And the prioritization. So that's the whole construct. But that's at a very superficial and a very simple level. But I think that there's a lot of work that goes on. So the way we start is we start with the customer need. We look for clarity of purpose. What is that? What is the need? You know, uh, you know, does that really solve a problem? Is it first of all a really a problem, or are we just perceiving it to be a problem, right? So there's a little bit of validation on the on the customer need that happens here. Then you go into something called a scientific rigor, right? Which is where we bring in all data analytics into the mix, where we are uh, we are leveraging data to say, okay, what are customers saying? Because you know, at least in the context of P2C, it's very hard, you know, to go speak to millions of people. Right, or even thousands of people. So then you need to kind of rely on data to go back and validate and look at what is the problem that you're trying to solve. And from there, you define the success criteria. Right, You pick a KPI and you say, okay, this is the KPI that I truly want to move. And you want that KPI to reflect the customer need directly. You don't want the KPI to be a business KPI or a marketing KPI or a technology KPI. Right, All of them could be your enablers or could be your secondary KPIs, but your core primary KPI needs to be a customer KPI, which would say that, which would truly, you know, if you move that KPI, it means that you've solved the problem or you're in the process of solving the problem, right? That's the mental test. And then you kind of establish clear ownership in terms of who does what. And, and, and I, when I go into subsequent slides, I'll talk about how do we start, right? You don't need, you don't need a huge team you don't need a ton of uh, engineering or coding or even design to start. You, uh, most of our experiment starts with a uh, pen and a paper and post-it notes, right? We run a lot of lean tests in the context of physical retail stores, and we also run a lot of digital A-B testing. But I would say most of our uh, you know, first, like V1, always starts with something very, very lean, as simple as pen and paper, and us going and just talking to customers, right? And getting a validation. And then the, the final thing is how do you then you start once you've identified what is the problem, then you have a clear view and a validation to it, then you start iterating on it. Then you start building you know, minimum viable products and then you start iterate on it. Right? That's the whole framework. I, we kind of do that again within this construct of doing, starting the customer need validation, aligning on the priorities and the measurement, which is what these two are. And then you go into execution, which is where ownership and iteration comes into picture. Yeah. 
So again, the art of uh, voice of customer, right? Have I think I think these are I would say who is doing the market research, whether it's done by product managers or it's done by some other department or if it's done by third parties. I think the core idea is to have like a very precise goal. When we have people who say, okay, let me go talk to everyone and I'll come back with a thing, I think that's like a red flag, right? You don't want to go talk to everyone to figure out the problem. You need to have a hypothesis or a starting point before you start talking to everyone because when you talk to 100 people, you know, if you don't have a hypothesis, it's going to be 100x more complex, right? Because you're going to end up with 100 different problems rather than having one hypothesis. You could start with one hypothesis, talk to customers and see if that hypothesis is is true or not false. If it's false, you go into the next hypothesis. But you still need to have a hypothesis before you start talking to customers because customers are not going to tell you their problem if you start with a very open-ended question, right? You have to get them to focus on one area and talk to them about problems within that area or that experience. Um, capture the big picture, again, you know, how that goal or customer need layers up. Uh, to a bigger picture or a vision or a strategy that you're building, and then uh, involve your agents, and those agents could be, as I said, could be UX engineers, whoever, right, a marketing business, whoever. But I think it's good to have more people so that everyone feels the pain. Though you would be the champion, but your work gets easier if everyone understands the pain, not just you, right? And then close the loop and be honest, right? Sometimes, uh, you know, I've seen. Uh, you know, typically product managers talking, you know, trying to uh, shove real customer problems under the carpet because they don't want to talk about it. But I think, I think being honest is the most important thing, right? If you don't acknowledge a problem, there's no way you're going to solve it, solve the problem. So uh, I kind of hinted at this of you know product management being art and science, right? I think you know you want to be oscillating here. Right, because you don't want, you know, being in one extreme corner uh, is 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 good. It's still good, right? But you you don't get the magic of it. The magic happens somewhere here. And if you are oscillating here, then your you know uh, ability to go articulate the problem to your executives, getting sign off, you know, getting the project initiated funded, right? All of that becomes much easier, right? If you, if you are solving a problem which is here then your executive buy-in and aligning on the priorities and you know aligning cross-functional teams and all of that becomes very very simple right but otherwise because not everyone would understand like the most complex algorithm or tensor flow or anything right if you are here again if you are here then you know people can start thinking oh you it's it's just bs right so you want to be somewhere in between where data tells part of the story but there's also actual voice of customers and actual customer needs, which also kind of supports that, then you have the full package. So how did we do this? Okay, so let me start off with a, with a construct in terms of how did we run uh, product acceleration and what are, and I'm just giving some examples. We've obviously executed a ton of uh, these projects in the last three and a half years, at least with the Sam's Club, that I've been uh, within membership and marketing, but I just picked top four. Uh, there are a lot more that I can talk about, but I think you'll see a common theme as we go through this. So we spoke about people, product, and digital, right? And kind of, as I said, culture sits somewhere in between, and I think this is where, uh, you know, Sam's Club has been a little unique, you know, because we get the latitude uh, of being a startup, but we are also more open to change and you know change the way in which we work and how we approach these problems, and also being uh, product-led in some way, shape, or form. So I would say the first thing, right, by moving from an IT mindset to a product mindset, I think this is very, very critical because uh, a lot of uh, organizations just work in this fashion, right? And you want to be moving towards this fashion if you really want to be solving real customer problems. So uh, in the IT mindset, people you know exist to serve perceived needs of business or marketing or whoever, right? Then you look, you're starting with a business problem or a business KPI rather than the customer problem. Uh, requirements are based on opinions, which is the left side of the art and science that we spoke about. You know, the then what happens is people with the who are higher up in the hierarchy, people with the highest you know, designation kind of dictate what they want to do and you just go execute that, right? 
but then it may or may not be right, right? We don't know that because you're not doing any validation, right? Prioritization done on first come first serve, which is like the, which is like, you know, the worst way of prioritization because again, we, I spoke about opportunity cost and trade-offs because at the end of the day, I think the most scarce resource within any product company are engineering and product and design bandwidth. So you want to be optimizing for that rather than trying to do everything for everyone. And if you end up doing this first come first serve, then you may, you may be investing your resources, your precious resources on solving problems which may not be driving the right level of impact that it should be. Um, and I think functional silos, again, you want, which is why I said you want product managers to be change agents who can bring people along, who can drive the vision, get everyone's buy-in on the problem that you're trying to solve. You know, people may disagree with a personal friend, but as long as everyone is aligned on the vision and the problem, I think things will get done, right? Um, teams focused on shipping projects, where, you know, I think, uh, you know, where it's uh, done and dusted, right? Once you've delivered, you move on to something else. Uh, I think you don't want to be doing that because then, you know, you cannot just launch a product and just leave it, right? Uh, because then who's going to be taking care of those customers, right? Especially if it's a, you know, if it's a transformational product and if you're picking on early adopters and, you know, you need to be taking care of them, right? You cannot just leave them aside. And then uh, teams move on to the next project, which is kind of uh, related. In, in the case of product management, you exist to serve the needs of the customer. You start with the customer. The uh, data-driven requirements based on product discovery, prioritization is tied back to key customer metric, which I spoke about already. Uh, Cross-functional teams and shared goals, right? It's okay even if your team delivers just one initiative, but if that's a billion-dollar initiative, it's worth it, right? You don't need to be delivering ten different projects. Um, you know, um, teams focus on driving results, and then te team iterates their work based on qualitative and quantitative learnings, which means that you want the team to be uh, to own what the product that they are putting out there, especially if it's customer facing, so that you're not moving the team from one to another. You're kind of optimizing, which is especially uh, important if you're either in the growth phase or the transformation phase, right? So uh, our inspiration, product acceleration, comes from acceleration of this because uh, from the Disney world, right? When you're in a roller coaster ride, and when if there is a change in direction and a change in uh, speed, it actually accelerates you, right? And people who have been on a roller coaster know this. When there is a change, it, you actually zoom through it, right? And that's ideally how you should be. But in the real world, it's very hard to do, right? When you have a leadership change or when you do a direction change, people stop back and they stop working on what they're doing and they wait wait for the direction, right? You don't want to be waiting because that's a very, very critical moment. You want to be accelerating and keep, and you can only do that if you are dwelling on the problem space, not too much on the execution phase, because if it's execution, you know, you picked up a problem based on uh, opinions rather than data, right? Then you'd be like, okay, I don't know what the next VP is going to want to work on, so let me just not ship it. You know, I just sit on it and see what happens, right? That's the worst thing to do. But if you're working on a customer problem, customer needs don't change that frequently, right? It's changing more more uh, frequently now compared to where we were 10 years back, but it doesn't change in the same way as a business direction changes. So as long as you are very sure and if you have done a ton of validation, you can, stick, you can stick to your guns and you can actually start accelerating in those moments where everyone is stalling, and that would give you the first mover advantage. I'll, again, I think this is a quote that I that I really like. You know, world is changing very fast. Big will not beat the small. It's very relevant in our case. Uh, it's the fast who will beat the slow, which is why we we are saying that you want to be fast and you want to take uh, you want to kind of use those moments to accelerate rather than stall. So principles of product management. I think I think this will help un, you know uh, answer your question and. Feel free to ask question if I didn't answer your question, right? So again, I think we start with the customer need, we start with the data, and then uh, we get everyone into the room, right? Every, every, you know, in terms of you know every sing, every single team, cross-functional team who has to kind of work to make that um, to make, to solve that problem needs to be at the table, right? You cannot make decision for others. If you do, then you don't have the buy-in, and they're not going to work for it. Right. You want everyone to be there, and you want to be focused on customer real problem, and you want to be focused on 
customer happiness index rather than you know executive happiness or business happiness or engineering happiness, right? If you want, and I think the technology of how you solve it is is an enabler, right? If you are very sure on the problem and if you have validated the problem and if you know it's a valid problem to solve, then you know you don't you don't worry about technology, you worry about technology after the validation, right? You want to use data science or machine learning or AI, or you want to just simply just build a very simple business rules engine, right? Is a decision that you should take after you have done the validation. So don't let the technology fool you to go do something fancy just because you love, want to do it, or just because it's sexy. Yeah. Um, so I know you started this presentation prefacing this is like B2C. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about, you know, uh, whether this these principles are only applicable to B2C environment or is it more more universal yeah. um, for B2B or managed service business model as well? Sure. No, I think I think these principles are common across, right? That there's a very you know, I think, and I was just talking to someone before, so the only difference that I see, at least from where I am, I don't have a ton of exposure on B2B side, but based on what I know, the only difference I see between B2C and B2B is in B2C, you have to, you have to rely on data, right? Because the, you're talking about, you know, millions of people or billions of people or, you know, hundreds of people, right? So there is no way for you to go and validate if you don't have the data to start with to help with the hypothesis building. In the case of B2B, you prop typically people have like your top 10 customers who contribute 70, 80% of your revenue. So it's still feasible to go talk to 10 people, right? It's not it's not billions of people, right? So you are okay to err a little bit more, you have a little bit more leash, uh, you know, to go to be driven a little more by qualitative research. But in terms of B2C, you cannot miss data, right? If you're missing data, then you're starting on the wrong foot. Uh, you know, that so and your pro your probability to succeed is much much lower. So that's the only difference I see between the two. Um, and you know, apart from that, I think these principles are still the same. Uh, I think it's it's very important even when while we are building new products to do the right instrumentation so that you're collecting data on ongoing basis, whether it's B two B or B two C, so that you know whether customers love it or hate it. Right? You can start looking at, you don't have to wait till the NPS after a month or a year when they want to renew the contract. If you know that the engagement has gone down, the probability of them renewing is just going to be low. Right? So you want to fix it sooner that, rather than wait, you know, even in the, in the case of B2B. Yeah. Uh, maybe this ROI come into picture? Yeah, so great question. I think that's where you know, we spoke about it. I think these are principles. So uh, I think I think the pro uh, you know you start with the ROI when you define within the problem space itself when you are finalizing the KPI for the success metric right the success metric needs to justify your ROI ROI is nothing but what is the upside that you're going to get divided by what is the effort that you're going to put in right so uh, you know as long as you know and you have to look at it in a relative terms for your trade-off discussion or to figure out your priorities. You know, whichever gives you that net number to be higher is where you need to be investing or that's what you need to be prioritizing, right? Because if you're going to get, I don't know, like $100 million out of one project and the second one is going to be 20 million, they're, you know, they're both a lot of numbers, right? But you want to be focusing more on the $100 million problem rather than 20 million, right? So, and, but again, the 20, 100 million is a combination of what is the upside that you're getting divided by how much effort that you're putting in, right? In terms of uh, man hours or you know, uh, you know the 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 what do you say the the sub on the supply side, right? From your uh, company standpoint, whether there's a design, engineering, product, uh, data analytics, you know, marketing so, initiative, all sorry, of that. Sorry, that's what my question was. So without getting into solutioning, you won't even know how much effort it's going to cost, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, and right. How do you even find the ROI? So the ROI is based on you start with the MVP, right? Once you've identified the problem, then you go into looking at, then you go into solutioning, then you see, okay. So let I'll, I'll come to that in next couple slides. So the 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 time when we make the decision whether to whether it's a green or a red, whether you want to go or no go, 
it happens at the time of what we call as product review, at least within the construct of Sam's and Walmart perhaps, right? Where we kind of dwell on the problem space. Then we, uh, at that point of time, after doing a number of tests, which could be lean test, A-B test, whatever, right? We have data to kind of supplement uh, our findings. We also, th at that point of time, we also engage with the tech leads at a very high level, at a consultative basis, to figure out if you were to solve this, what are different approaches? If you go with approach one, approach two, approach three, what the high level LOA is for MVP, then that kind of feeds in. It may not be 100% accurate. It may be 80% or 70% or even 50%, but it's okay, right? Even if, you, if the whole point of uh, you know, operating in this way is it's okay to even start if, with imperfect information because you're, you're doing an iteration. You're not going to go solve a one-year problem. You're solving it in chunks in every two weeks. At some point of time, if you hit a big roadblock, which kind of uh, increases your effort exponentially, you can come back and make that argument and still make a decision whether you want to proceed with the problem or is that the moment where you kill the project and go to something else because now the, uh, that ROI which was positive before has become negative. In comparative terms, but sometimes it may not be ROI, correct? Sorry? Sometimes it may not be ROI, so it may be something else, like yeah. related futures or something. Yeah, exactly. So, which again depends on the type of problem you're solving. If you're solving, uh, I think if if it's a you know if it's a growth problem or an optimization problem, you will have a very clear ROI, right? But if you're doing a transformational or a strategic shift, then it may not be all ROI, right? Because now you want to venture. It's basically your future is at stake, right, at that point of time, right? Then you dwell a little bit more on data and your qualitative research a little bit more. Yeah. So I, I, I think, you know, the idea of this thing is everyone is working in unison, uh, you know, because you want cross-functional teams to work together. The, the, uh, the role of senior management in this case is to just unblock and clear the path. So one of the principles that we have in this construct is no one problem or blocker should exist for more than six days. So I remember I started the presentation by saying product acceleration is nothing but a meeting that we run at 9 a.m. on every Friday. So at the end of the meeting, we have very clear action items of what the blockers are. Blockers in our case could be a legal uh, compliance issue, could be an op ops issue, could be an associate uh, in a internal issue, could be an uh, you know prioritization issue, could be an engineering issue, right? So we have we assign those blockers or problems to very clear owners uh, within that forum, and they have to resolve it sooner. But the latest that they can come back is by the next Friday. So we don't want the same issue to persist for more than six days, uh, you know, without being unsolved. Right. Some problems may still linger on, but then you at least have a clear owner and accountability to go drive that. And sometimes when you don't have, uh, you know, when it becomes difficult, you know, we also go and invite some of the executives to join this meeting so that they can make the decision then and there, right? So that you're not kind of lingering on. So I would say 80 to 90 percent of the issues, uh, you know, do get resolved within that time frame. Uh, always focus on the result and focus on iteration. Any questions on this? Yeah. So, um, picking on a point previously, uh, when you showed the slide about the different stages, you spoke about success metrics, and uh, you specifically said the success metric should be defined in terms of the user. Customer metric. Yeah, yeah customer metric. Right? Uh, however, just recent, like more uh, recently, you said you know it's a hundred million dollar business versus a twenty million dollar business. You go for the hundred million. So where do you make the decision between a customer-facing metric versus a monetization or business metric? Yeah, so I kind of said that 100 million or 20 million in the concept of B2B, right? Because in B2B, uh, you, know, it's, you know, you have that uh, 20, uh, 10, 10, top 10 or top 20 customers who basically their want is of higher priority because they kind of you know, are the majority of the users anyways. And you know, irrespective of B2B or B2C, if you have a number of problems, you want to go solve a problem, which caters to 90% or 80% of the segment, right? Uh, irrespective of, uh, and you, I'm not saying you should not solve the 10%, right? But in terms of relative priority and trade-off, right? So, which is why I made that comment in the in the framework of B2B, right? Because then, you know, 100 million is based on what those top 10 customers want, right? Uh, you know, it could be either so that they they retain your license and continue to engage with you, or you know, if you don't do this, they or if it's a trial offer where they're going to fall off, right? So. 
Yeah. You're talking about sprint and honor. As a product manager, manager, you're also an agile coach. You do both strategy and also. Like, well, agile um, coach, I would say, is uh, falls within program management or pro project management. I would say, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, they are the primary. But it doesn't mean that you can wash your hands off it. Everyone who's part of the agile or scrum team. Mm -hmm you know, has equal say in it, right? Which is why we said everyone has a seat at the table, whether it's a product acceleration, which is more executive focus, or whether it's grassroots level on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Which is a daily scrum call or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it's a joint responsibility. There is, yes, there is an owner that typically falls within, sometimes tech lead plays the role of a scrum master, sometimes it's project manager, sometimes it's program manager, sometimes it, it is product manager, right? It depends on how your team is uh, constructed. So I kind of hinted at this before. So you know, this is the point where we make the go no go decision, right? We kind of do an end-to-end -end discovery and hypothesis testing before writing this first line of code, uh, because you want to be minimizing the impact to your overall bandwidth on the supply side, right? Otherwise, you would just be iterating and you would be disturbing everyone without, <coughs> them, and the team will not be able to deliver anything, right? At, at this point, you know, when you're going for a product review, we actually take product reviews is very sacred for us in some way, shape, or form. We take it very seriously. We have very senior leaders who are part of this uh, product review, uh, and which is why we want to kind of dwell more on the problem space. We will have few slides on the how, which is a solution space or approaches, different approaches. But I would say 70% or 60% of the product review is more on the problem, hypothesis, data, metrics. And then the other 30 to 40% might be how and approaches and LOEs and all of that. So I'm going to kind of get into the uh, product mindset and some of the case studies. And I'll be talking about all my case studies in the, in the framework of this. What is the real life problems we are trying to solve? How will we know we have solved the problem? How will we test, learn, and iterate? So you know, all the case studies would be within this this framework. So uh, what were some of our problems? Okay, so we I have four problems, and you know I don't have to necessarily cover all of them because you know you know the framework, right? So you know if it, there are more questions, I'm happy to take them. We have about 35 minutes, 40 minutes, I guess. So uh, <coughs> feel free to ask questions. We don't have to cover everything because if you get two of it everything else is going to follow the same pattern. So here are the problems, right? We, ha we know that the customers, they don't like standing in checkout lines, right? That was one of the problems. Uh, they don't see value of membership. Uh, they don't see value of higher tier membership because we have two tiers, right? We have the base members and class members. Um, and they don't like finding their favorite items to be out of stock. So these are the five problems that we started with. And these were the hypothesis, right? Customers are busy, they don't have time to stand in long lines for checkout. And it's an irony, right? So in some way, shape, or form, you're making your customer stand in line to pay you money, right? So uh, when, when customers are paying you money, you should just take it. You should not like add friction at that point of time, right? Uh, the second one is customers are unable to discover all the great values, products, and services available at their local store by themselves, uh, which is why, which is why. So this is the problem, but this is the cost. Right? Because they don't they're not getting the value because they are not able to discover great products and services or we don't have relevant services. Right? Those were the two hypotheses that we started off with. And this is where we started between the two. Uh, customers are at present do not find value in this membership. Customers like the option of being able to order items online if unavailable in store and have it shipped to them at a later point of time. Here's the answer. So when we, start, we started with NPS, right? And we, we knew that one of the biggest areas were checkout speed, right? So but NPS, again, as I said, is a very hard, you know, it's a very complex problem to solve. So we can start here, but then you need to have different hypotheses to go, different approaches to go solve this problem. So we took, so this is the data, and this is a little bit of a art, right? A customer voice of customer. It took twice as long to check out, then to collect my items. My only up, uh, complaint is exit, lines are way too long. The lines for checkout were too long and not enough cashiers to check them out. So then you are mirroring, you are adding a little bit of art and science. I won't say this is the most sophisticated data, but this is what I'm allowed to show. We, we obviously did a lot more analysis that I'm not allowed to share, but, but this kind of gives you a feeling of where we started. Okay.
Okay, so then we started with the solution. Yep. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Sure. Uh, two slides before this. Okay. So I'm actually, no, the hypothesis. Okay. Right? So I'm kind of curious, like, why there is just one hypothesis? Usually, why don't Walmart come, so why doesn't Walmart come up with more than two hypotheses? For, for a particular problem? For a particular problem. For example, like, they don't like standing in checkout line, so is it like, uh, is it the faster checkout is something that they're looking forward to, or is it like some kind of uh, mental engagement during the check-on process, like maybe putting a football match over there or any kind of videos that could have helped. Or the other thing is like self-checkouts. This is, if you see the statistics, the self-checkout actually takes longer time than checking out with the customer, with the employees themselves. And even then, the customers don't complain because it's their responsibility to check it out. So if you consider that hypothesis, you came up with a very different product, with a very different solution for the same problem. So let me, let, let, me, let me answer the question. We, when we came up with this, we already had self-checkout. So it was already part of the mix, right? So we were not going to create, uh, you know, we could have gone and optimized that, but as you said, you know, people, you know, there's a mental uh, decision making that is happening. Members who are going to go to self-checkout, they will do. Members who are not willing to do it will not do, right? So that's, that's part one of your answer. The second part of your answer is, uh, you know, we did not, we obviously came up with multiple different hypotheses, right? That's the, uh, I, I'm not sharing everything here at this part of this, uh, but as part of the product review, that's where, you know, we articulate all the different hypotheses and various approaches, right? Uh, but then this is where we zeroed in saying, we have to start somewhere, right? You, have, you start with one hypothesis, as I said, you know, true or false. If it's false, then you move on to the next one, right? In this case, uh, you know, uh, I don't remember if this was the first hypothesis or the second, but it was within the first top three that we went ahead with it, right? For some of it, you know, you could start with some and maybe, you know, it didn't work out or customers, you know, there was no product market fit, right? Yeah. That's the difference between incumbents and startup. Incumbent, they have data to uh, to state the problem, but startup, they don't have data. So how can uh, we come up with a, a problem statement if you don't have data before? Like how to come up with this data or just well, if you don't have a data, then you have to rely more on this, on qualitative answers, right? Voice of customers. So I think so. We don't have customers, like. We don't have customers, but you have prospects or potential mm -hmm. customers, okay. right? So basically, when you are starting with your startup, then you kind of start with who your target segment is, right? You're not going to go sell everything to everyone, right? You have to start with a niche. So you pick up a niche and you say who are your segments, right? And you want to define your segment in a very <coughs> precise way because you could not just say I want to go sell this product to everyone who is 20 to 30 living in San Francisco Bay Area, right? Then you are ending up with a segment of million, right? And you don't know whose opinion matters and you'll just get lost, right? You want to start by saying, well, I want let me start with busy mom who works 9 to 5, who lives within the zip code or this a, a radius of 10 miles. Uh, you know, who uh, doesn't have one hour to prepare meals or something, right? So you want to be very precise uh, within your starting point so that you could actually go get this, right? And then, uh, and then you kind of dwell on that. But that's, uh, you know, if you're starting a new product, I think that's a very different problem. So I think uh, may not fit into this construct, as you've said, because you know, then you're not influencing. You have all the authority. To, you know, if you're starting a startup, then you know you don't need to be the change agent. You are the agent, right? Mm -hmm. Then you could just go build it. But then, what you need to do, you need to spend even more time on the problem space and validation space, so that you're not building something that doesn't fit the market need. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So what we came up with a, with, with an app which was called Scan and Go, um, and basically what we did is we started with two engineers, right? Uh, and we started with two engineers with a very lean test. So as you can see, they have a clipboard. They have a very half-baked kind of uh, app, which was which was like built within like 48 hours. Uh, again, and then they said, okay, go quick sign in. So have you guys been to some of the Walmarts? Have it today, right? You have people who can check you out outside of the line, right? Yeah, uh, uh, with with, with handheld devices. We did something like that, but it was not like scalable or anything. We did it in one club with two engineers, right? Uh, and then uh, we started by saying, okay, go sign in, you know, scan as you shop, show the receipt, right? But then we iterated on this for over, uh, I would say, 12 weeks. We did this experiment in multiple different clubs. 
with just two people going and doing it, uh, and then we did rotated the people, of course. So you know, we started with engineering taking the lead, but then product managers, designers, uh, UX, uh, you know, researchers, everyone got involved, and we ran this experiment for a while. And the uh, and the product that we ended up building, you know, of course, the scan and go that you see today is like version four, right? V four. But then I'm talking about version zero dot one, right? Which is this, and we started this journey. I would say in 2000, February 16, right? So, and so this is even before this. So, sometime in 2015, um, you know, late 2014. Um, but then, you know, what we saw was, and I don't want to go through into the journey because I want to focus on the framework of how we went through the journey rather than going very deep into the solution itself. Uh, but then, what? Any question? Okay. So then, what we saw was. That, you know, this kind of gives us the validation, right? So we started the problem, the outcome or the solution was scan and go, and this was the, the result, right? Which has both in terms of usage, adoption, and we also have, uh, you know, voice of customer, which is, you know, how many, you know, how many companies, you know, in a retail kind of a setup can have an app which is like 4.6 to 4.8 on a 5, right? It's very rare. So we ended up with a product which was awesome. And uh, and we then went on to version two, version three, version four, uh, and we went through scaling it. And there are a couple videos here that I want to kind of talk about or show you. Hey guys, I'm Frugal, and I'm here today to talk to you about Sam's Club Scan and Go app. It is these are actual customers, right? We didn't pay them, it is so right? Awesome. It's just a validation. <laughs> And I actually discovered these videos as I was preparing for some of the conferences or speech, and I didn't even know that these existed. Oh, that people not, actually made videos or on, on, on YouTube, right? So this was amazing. Scan your first item right here. This is so cool because I can see how much I'm spending on scanning as I go. Here's the first item. Here's the second item. Here's the third item. Here's the fourth item. Here's the fifth item. Here's the sixth item. Here's the seventh item. Here's the eighth item. Here's the ninth item. Here's the tenth item. Here's the eleventh item. Here's the twelfth item. Here's the thirteenth item. Here's the fourteenth item. Here's the fifteenth item. Here's the sixteenth item. Here's the seventeenth item. Here's the eighteenth item. Here's the nineteenth item. Here's the twentieth item. Here's the twenty-first item. Here's the thirty-first item. Here's the forty-first item. Barcodes right here on top. Ready? Okay, just pushing this button right here. Wow, look at that. Like, I didn't even have to make sure. I just knew I wanted water. Okay, now I need to. I'm going to pause this now because she, really she goes through this process. This it's club, about a three minute, uh, four minute video. But that kind of gives you an idea. Yeah? Did you guys have an adoption KPI for this? Yes. Uh, what, what, what did you hit? What did we hit? Uh, well, give me one second. So, as you can see, adoption was the key KPI that we were measuring, right? Uh, so, uh, I think I cannot give you the exact numbers, but uh, you know, uh, let me tell you this: this year we ended with almost similar uh, number of transactions in terms of revenue that happened on Scan and Go, similar to our e-commerce side. Wow. So it's a lot. I cannot tell you exactly what percentage, but it's in billions. <coughs> uh, okay. Uh, what about the final check? So uh, once they bought it and gone out. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah. That's the next slide. But uh, but I, I want to kind of quickly show a couple videos here, right? I think it's awesome. You know, you you get you get real validation when people are making videos for the product that you built without you even knowing it, right? That's like the absolute uh, success metric. You basically open the app and you just scan your first item. Scan it, just that simple. So my times come up that I just scanned, 3398. We scan my next item and scan our headphones that are on there. Scan again. Our safety protective box that we just bought and our comment times. And then follow this. Little bit. Simple way to shop at Sam's Club, and you don't have to stand in those long lines anymore. It's great. So if you haven't had a chance, check out the Scan and Go app and let me know what you think. So it kind of gives you. Uh so you kind of head to the exit. That was a second phase of the problem that we had to solve, right? Because that was not 
part of the MVP. The MVP was just like if you have a manual receipt, just like how someone would check all the items, they would do the same mm -hmm. with this. But then this in version two, what we built was, you know, we gave a handheld device even to our own associates who would just scan the final barcode that you saw, and they would get a, uh, a list, itemized list, just like how you get it on paper, and they can, they are able to do that uh, as you speak. Right. Uh, is that a bottleneck? You think so? For instance. Uh uh, would they have to then look at all the items to make sure that you know it's 12 or 15 But that part, we were not solving that problem, right? right? We were solving the problem of checkout, right? right? We've created a new problem or, you know, once you solve one problem, you want to go, you're, you're, you're so tempted to go downstream, which is why it's very important that you, uh, that you dwell or you continue to solve the same problem. You don't ship and move on to your next product. Right. Because if we were operating in an IT mindset, we would have moved on to something else, right? But now we have to look at our customer journey end to end, right? So we did solve that problem. Uh, and we are still solving that problem, right? Uh, I'll come to that. Uh, I have one more question. Yeah. So how, how did you guys plan for edge cases as you were designing this? So let's, uh, some things I can think of is, I don't know, there's no internet in certain areas, right? Uh, yeah. So, so Sam's Club actually has open uh, Wi-Fi. Okay. So if you're shopping, you have that. That was another problem because it was built for more internal associates than uh, customers. Mm -hmm. So we had to go solve the problem from an infrastructure standpoint once we, we started scaling this. As you can see, fraud, risks is a big thing. Once we solved this one, we had to go solve it and we're still solving it. Uh, we implemented guest, we had to implement guest checkout to eliminate login friction because you know you don't want login is still a friction point. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a robust platform and I think one other thing was the exit thing we, which we are actually solving right now. I cannot talk a lot about it right now at this point of time. But think of it, uh, the approach that we are taking is very similar to what you guys see at the airport for security check. So we are taking a very similar approach. Correct. Okay, so you got the problem, you got the construct, right, in terms of moving from problem to outcome to result to iterate, right, which is why we need to continue to iterate on the same problem. Uh, otherwise, we will, we will have solved one part of the, think of it as a supply chain, there's a supply chain guy here. So you would have solved one problem, but then you would have pushed the problem downstream or upstream, one of the two areas, and your supply chain is as strong as the weakest link, so then you have created weakest link somewhere else, right? Okay. So problem number two, uh, value of membership, right? Because that was the second hypothesis. So traits of our labs members, uh, they run by fresh, they buy fewer categories, low awareness of key offering, and uh, the voice of customer, this does not seem like a fun place, uh, it's not a fit for me, I, I don't know if I'm getting a good deal, I don't go to club enough, right? So those are the those are the things. So what we did is, before we get into the solution, so uh, what we did here was, we started with the data, of course, right? And the data was that we started looking at all the labs members, and uh, we did a detailed analysis. And we also built a machine learning model on that uh, in a very lean way. Uh, and, and that model basically told us that, you know, with 78% accuracy, which is pretty good, uh, whether based on the first 12 days of a new member, it told us whether this member is going to renew their membership 360 days later or not, right? So we, we took that model and we said, okay, if first 12 days is so critical, uh, then what can we do within the 12 days? And we are not like any other store, we are bulk warehouse retailer, right? Which means that members you know, may not even come more than once within the first 12 days, maximum twice, right? So then we said, okay, if we were to solve for the 12 days, then the day that we need to really solve for is day zero, is the day when they join. If you're not able to influence them and show them the value within that, we have one shot at that customer. And if we don't do that, you know, the chances that they're going to renew is less than whatever, 22%, right? So we've kind of lost them in the first thing. And I think analysis like this is very helpful for startups too, right? If you have the data, because now you know which part of the problem that you need to solve because retention is a big problem. Right, retention, just like NPS, is a is a is a very complex problem. Now you at least have a hypothesis that you can start your uh, problem framing from, right? Okay. So then, what we came up with is we combined behavior science and a data science. So we took that data and we looked at we we, we have we also have a very few uh, psychologists, uh, consumer behavior scientists within our company. So we kind of uh, leverage them for solving very complex 
customer uh, behavior issues. So we kind of brought all of them together and we said, look, if you were to really shape that day zero experience, you know, from a psychology standpoint to make the to make the brand stick, what would you do, right? Uh, and then we came up with we said, okay, so if you go back, customer said it's not fun. They said it doesn't fit me. They don't know if you're getting a good deal or not, and they don't go to the club enough, right? So if you were to if you were to translate this to a business problem, which I don't recommend, but I'm just saying, if you were to convert this customer problem into a business problem, it means that the customers, uh, you know, they are not buying enough categories. They are not buying fresh, which is why they don't think they have to go to the club that often, right? And they are not aware of our offerings, right? So then it, it becomes a business problem, marketing problem, you know, experience problem, a bunch of those. So then where did we start? is uh, we said, okay, we'll make your day zero fun. We are going to gamify your day zero, right? And then we said, okay, and as part of that, we are going to take you and nudge you into all of those key items or categories which we, where you will organically find value. And as part of doing this, we are also going to expose you different benefits, right? And we are going to capture your email address. We are going to get your .com account sell done. We are going to get you, talk to you about Scan and Go app. We are going to basically talk to you about how you can save time and save money. Right. So I have a quick video here. So let's so when they join as a member, we give them this card and we say, you know, Go to this section, open your uh, phone, go to transfer.com slash play, and then you go through this experience. And then we gamify it. So the first question is, what is the color of the sun? Then you take them to organic section, right? Then if you started buying bananas, they're going to come back and buy bananas, right? And then you win as you go along, right? Go to bakery. What did you buy? And then as you're choosing, you get $2 off, $3 off. And you also get a free Sunday and a free pizza at the end of the year. So we made it fun. And I think this is a video we need to be sent to all the clubs, right? So that they understand what they are supposed to do. Anyways, I think we can stop here. So, uh, but at the end of the day, I think the way we started this, again, is we, we ran this with literally post-it notes, right? What you're seeing is a V1 or a V2. The first iteration of this was actually with post-it notes, and I think I have a slide on that. Uh, maybe I took it out. But uh, you know what we do is we we were actually standing in the clubs. We ran this uh, experiment for 16 weeks, um, and you know all of us rotated. But then we would stand there. Anyone who and we would stand by the membership desk. If you would join as a member, we would uh, say, we would just shop along with you. We would say, okay, here's a post-it note. Here are a printout of questions. Why did you go answer these questions? The first few we shopped along, then we didn't do it because it's hard. But then we said go answer these questions, at the end of it we'll give you a free Sunday and a pizza, right? It didn't take a single line of code, right? We ran this, we iterated on just on pen and paper for 16 weeks before we built the first version. The first version that we built was also completely with very minimal internal effort. It was, you know, we kind of used a couple startups. So what we did is, we had them build all of this experience siloed, not on our domain. But then at the end of the day, they would just trigger a gift card for $20 or $10. So there was no, there was minimal or no work on our side. And then when it started, actually started working and we started seeing the results in V2, we brought it completely in-house, right? And uh, instead of giving them gift cards, we started giving them instant savings, which is a core promotion anyways. So now it feels more uh, built in, right? So we did not use a single engineering bandwidth on this for almost, I would say, eight months. Uh, and, we, and I'm not saying we have to do that for every single project, but this is just so complex. And this was a big enough problem to solve that we wanted to make sure we're spending enough time and doing justice in validation. 
before we jump into the solution space. My question is like, because this is NPS, right? You said yeah. like this cu customers are going to renew after a year. Yeah. So what was your number to start with? So these were the three things. Okay. Remember we went back to the business problem, right? From a customer problem. And these would be leading <coughs> indicators, which would lead to a renew, renewal, right? So we said, what is the format of behavior? Like 20 days. Right. So then we said, okay, are they are they shopping in multi-channel? Have they act have we activated them on .com, right? Uh, are they shopping more frequently? Are they coming in if the the control was a test? If the control is coming once in three weeks, are these guys coming once in two weeks? I'm just making this up, but that's what it means. And then are they shopping more unique categories compared between test versus control, right? People who played the game and the people who did not. Or the three check boxes, like okay, are they buying more? Are they buying? So we different. nudge them to pharmacy. They enroll in pharmacy. We send them to fresh. We send them to bakery. Are they buying repeat? Right? And all of those. Okay? So, and then basically this is, and you guys saw the video, so I don't need to go through the slide, but this is how we kind of did it. So then, results, right? We saw, I cannot give you exactly percentage, but NMT and human treasurer members shop more often. They shopped in uh, uh, member shop in the first visit, higher percentage, uh, made the at least you know repeat purchases. They shopped in more unique categories. Uh, members spend lower than control but higher overall. Higher first uh, visit penetration in select categories. Right. So these are the leading indicators. Obviously, you don't want to be building a product and waiting for one year. Right. So which is why you have to break down when you take big problems like NPS and renewal. If it's one year out, you have to. Which is why you need to build a tree and say what are your leading indicators which direct, directionally shows you whether what you're doing is right or wrong. It kind of gives you a gut fit. Yeah. How to um, decide how long uh, the test is going to be? Like one year, 16 weeks? So in this case, I think we were just, we had, uh, so again, that's a separate thing. So what we typically do is we have a slide, typically what we call a Stolgate slide. So we, you know, if you, you have very specific success metrics, customer metrics and business metrics, once you hit those thresholds, you go to the next phase. So think of it as a Starbucks. So we start with tall, then we go to grande, then mid time, right? So uh, and that literally, that's what the slide says, right? Tall, grande, and mid time. So basically, you know, if you it basically it says if your unique category shop is more than three, and if your repeat purchase is this, so you would actually come up with the rules when when you think it's ready to graduate and go to the next level right and going to the next level actually means putting in more technology more work right so you have to kind of do that and there's a little bit of science and uh, art to that as well okay so i guess i guess you guys saw the first video so i'm going to skip this but what i saw was you know and i was preparing when i was preparing for this talk i started googling and i saw so many people kind of talking about it there was Someone who mentioned this in slick deals. How cool is that, right? Uh, in earlier days, if they did it, we would have we, it would have hit our PNL because we would have given away a lot of gift cards, right? Mm -hmm. Thankfully, we put it in the in house, right? So unless we do a validation of your membership, we don't give you that anymore. So, um, but I think it's kind of uh, pretty cool, and you know, people made videos out of it. You know, uh, between you know, it's about a close to three minute video, right? So then the other one was what we launched last year same time where basically people said that they don't realize value of being class member where so we club members so then we started uh, you know we we came up with hypothesis again customer needs you know what I'm getting by being a plus member so very similar format right I think you know it should be very easy to understand so what we did is we started with uh, you know again simple lean tests uh, this one we didn't do. We don't prolong it too long. You know, it's every every problem is different. So this, you know, at some point of time when we got enough data, we just went all in, right? We made a policy change where we said we want to make. And a lot of this is because, uh, you know, though we were solving a customer problem, there was also a strategic direction from executives to go all in. So we made a policy change, and we had to do a lot of, uh, you know, communication, marketing, all of that. So basically, we launched free shipping uh, February fourteenth last year, right? Uh, the, uh, and basically, with that, we not only launched free shipping, but we also, uh, you know, uh, uh, use that opportunity to go, you know, fix a lot of these things. We we went from three tier, uh, from three types of membership to two types. In the within the lower level, you had savings and mem uh, business members. We combined them into one. So basically, we came up with just two tiers. Simplified membership. There was. I'm going to save the details on this, but basically that's that's the problem we solved. There is 
one video here, so I'll kind of go through that quickly. I'm Jessica Gartalia. Sam's Club offers free shipping for premium members and simplifies its membership tiers. Starting today, the Walmart-owned Warehouse Club will give free shipping on online orders for plus members on 95% of the items it sells. Sam's Club is also converting its three membership plans into two. <coughs> Sam's Plus will carry a $100 annual fee. We'll have much more later today on WJZ and WJZ.com. Yeah, so basically that was a, and we, we actually got a ton of PR on this, though we didn't really uh, plan for it. We got over 1,000 hits from Forbes.com and Wall Street Journal and all of them. Uh, and what we learned directionally and we iterated on it, you know, we, we, we iterated on what the call to action should be, what the promotion should be, how do we talk about it, what areas should we talk about it, dot, both in club and dot com and mobile, you know, how do we position. So that's where most of our iteration, iteration went here because we kind of, it was a policy change, so we kind of, you know, at some point we did a cutoff and we went all in. Uh, the fourth problem, I'll go through this very quickly. This is a, if you remember the hypothesis, the fourth problem was customers like if they don't, if the club doesn't have the item that they're looking for, they would go and they would uh, be happy to order it online so that they get it later. So what we came up was is what we call as endless aisle or kiosk, and we built this kiosk and uh, well, uh, what we found out was that you know. People started using this as a more, uh, you know, I would say like a play toy within the stores. Uh, you know, as soon as we put these in about 10 clubs, that was the first test that we did. We saw a huge jump in engagement and sessions, but we did not see enough transactions or checkout happening. So, but we know that a lot of retailers have this, right? And this we built three years back. So a lot, lot of retailers have, have gone forward with it, uh, you know, since then and maybe they are finding a product market fit. But to answer your question of one hypothesis that did not work, right? So that was this. We actually had a goal. Weekly sessions, you know, these were some of the sample goals. What was the actuals? Uh, you know, what were the typical items bought? And what we found out was a product market fit is not achieved, right? So we kind of shelved it and we moved on, right? If we had worked and put it in all 600 clubs, you know, it would have been so much waste of time and energy and operations and marketing, right? So we kind of, uh, so we kind of uh, learn from our failures and, we, and the idea is to fail fast and fail gracefully. So 10 market tests, 10 club tests was easy. We didn't do a lot of work in-house. Uh, we tried to play around. We kind of, the first iteration was we just put our own samsclub.com site on a kiosk without even building anything new. Uh, second iteration, we kind of you know, made it more responsive, made it more a uh, better UI for the form factor. That's all we did. We didn't require a ton of effort. If when it failed, we just took them away or we repurposed the kiosk to do something else. Um, but yeah, so that was a thing. But I want to kind of quickly walk you, the, you know, through taking truly taking the test to the next level. I want to uh, show these two videos, which I think Let's are pretty cool. Coffee. No, not the roast or aroma. Let's talk about how technology has created a richer, smoother way to buy that coffee. Welcome to Dallas, Texas, and the launch of Sam's Club Now. More lab than club, it's where the latest innovations in shopping technology are being tested and implemented to make buying coffee or anything else fun and frictionless. All you need is your smartphone. Just open the Sam's Club Actually, this store doesn't have any POS. Let's say you can't the only way to check out is your phone. Ask your phone where to find it. Buying coffee. Digital maps will map out your path and show you the fastest way to everything in the club. And say goodbye to paper shopping lists. Smart list technology will plot out your shopping trip and keep track of items as you add them to your cart. It's the smartest shopping list in retail. Augmented reality will soon turn shopping into a virtual. This is the second version of new Smart products located throughout the club. See them come to life for a digitally enriched shopping experience. At Sam's Club, we're continually leveraging the most advanced shopping technology to deliver a faster, easier, more convenient way to shop. And here's the best news. Just scan the code on your phone and breeze right through checkout. You and your coffee will never have to wait in line again. The future of shopping is here and now. Here at Sam's Club Now. So this is a, this is a test 
store that we opened in Dallas last November. It's very different from the normal stores. It's only 20,000 feet. It's not massive like some of the other stores. And uh, how many things do I have? Maybe just this the last video. I just uh, finished shopping at the new Sam's Club Now store in Dallas. I liked how easy it was to use the app and to navigate the store and to scan my items and very quickly get out. Again, this is a customer video. We didn't make this one. The previous one was our video. It worked even better than the actual scan and go app. It was quick, responsive. I wasn't expecting so much from this initial visit. The app, it was really easy to use if you needed to find something it helped you if they had it, it would show you exactly what aisle and it gave you a little map. I'd say it's pretty easy to get around. I really like the map feature on the Sam's Club Now app that I let me navigate the store and find where I needed to be, kind of find where I was. One thing I did dislike is it was a little bit unclear about how to uh, pay on the app, but once I figured it out, it was very easy to do. I thought it was cool with the original price tag that had the item descriptions and the barcodes on them. Very clean. It was very interesting experience. Um, had the chargers, the, all of the samples. Everybody was very nice and friendly. The employees that are present in the store are readily available. Okay, I'm going to pause this now, I think. Um, again, there's a customer video. I don't know what this is. It's a 30 second video, so maybe you just watch that. So this is the next iteration. We just filed a patent for this. Remember in Scan and Go, you had to actually scan the barcodes. Now we don't even have to scan that because sometimes barcode is under underneath and you don't want the customer to push through the train. So you just scan the item or the logo or brand or anything. It will pick it up using computer vision. Yeah, that's it. So not everything that I spoke, uh, disclosure, not everything that I spoke today is uh, are my products, but I think, you know, it kind of uh, brings everything together. Uh, as you can see, a new member treasurer and, you know, Scan and Go is not my product, you know, it's, but, you know, it has a big membership component, so we kind of partner with them. Uh, Sam's Club now is a completely different team, but it has a lot of membership components, uh, so which we kind of partner on. Uh, there is a big membership piece to it which I'm not talking because we are in the process of filing patent for that, so I, I'm not allowed to talk on that. But then there are, you know, as you can see, we kind of uh, the, the story is that you want to go through that process of iterations, you know, looking at the real customer problem, validating it, spending more time on problem space, then figuring out what your success metric or the goal is. Then you want to go through that process. Uh, any questions? Did, did I? Did you guys, uh, did I answer all the questions that you guys had initially where I said hold on, hold on? Okay. Yeah, um, I have a question about uh, retaining product talent uh, in the Bay. As a director, how do you do it? Do you have any tips? That's a great question. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough one, right? Customer problems are easier to solve. Uh, retention, you know, employee retention is a harder problem. I would say I think the key thing is, um, you know, it's a little bit about branding, right? I think though we as Sam's Club are not known, but Walmart Labs is pretty well known. Uh, so there's a little bit of the brand. I would say the biggest thing is uh, we I, we feel really good uh, talking about we being the best technology and a product company within the retail space. You know, uh, within the construct of Wal even within the Walmart, right? I mean, the kind of testing that we are doing, like we have a store just for technology lab, right? As you can see, so we are. I feel feel pretty good. You know, being the trajectory. So I think. Uh, so one, if someone is passionate about driving uh, impact at scale, this is a right mix from a Sam's Club standpoint of being a startup but having a security and being being able to operate at scale and you know having you know the brand name. I think that's a unique place where we see ourselves. So that's a big part of it. The second thing is I would say within product management, uh, you know, as I said, I think initially in one of those slides, you know, we feel like we are truly product-led company, a product management-led company. We have come a long way, right? We have come a long way from being influencers and change agents to now where we are three years later, where, you know, people, the first question an executive or a CEO asks is, you know, if something is either good or bad, is who is the product manager on this, 
right? Uh, which is both good and scary sometimes, right? So, uh, so we've come a long way in that. So being able to own, but again, it comes with its own occupational hazard, right? Of not, you know, being able to, uh, you know, someone putting so much responsibility on your shoulders with, you know, again, as product managers, we don't control our resources, whether engineering, design, or analytics, or data, or behavior science, right? And there's a very, st there's still a very strong business community within a, you know, a retailer like Walmart, right? Like a buyers and merchants and all of them, they've been doing this for the last 30 years. So it's very hard. You know, I think we see this as a common, I think we see mutual learning of us being able to do things differently. So I was telling someone earlier, we are thinking digital first. It may not be digital experience, but even if you take supply chain or some of the back end or you know, a back room, inventory management, all of those, we are thinking digital first in terms of solving a problem, the best way to solve the problem in the cheapest, fastest way. Uh, and being able to do that, the book may still be offline, right? But it, that's okay, right? Uh, but you need to start the journey somewhere. So I feel like, you know, if you're talking about impact, scale, a sense of accomplishment, being able to see your product shipped as fast at this scale, uh, you know, it's just very satisfying as a product manager. I think if you are intrinsically motivated, I think that's the right place. You know, Sam's Club is the right place to work. Any more questions here? Yeah? Uh, I'm curious about, um, you talked about the, the organizational transformation from a non-product-led organization into a more- Yeah, we, we didn't have product managers right. three, four years back, into right? So product -driven that's organization. Right. What did you do, you as a like, company, what did you do to make that shift to a more product-minded um, leadership or even culture? Yeah, so I would say use the same framework that we spoke about. Pick one item, do a lean test, show the impact, right? You know, if you go all in, then you would be doing building a product in isolation and then you know, bringing it and unveiling it and customers will protect it, right? You don't want to do that even in your own profession, right? Mm -hmm. You want to take a product m m management approach even to kind of drive this, where you want to go pick one area, right? So when I started uh, my, uh, you know, three and a half years back when I started the company, I was only owning the dot-com version of membership, right? Uh, on the e-commerce side, dot-com. Dot I started with actually marketing, then I got membership, right? Then you, you know, and people did that similar thing, and then we went through a number of reorgs, you know that, right? I think we go through, you know, we go through restructuring and all of that, which is part of, uh, you know, a lot of big companies. Mm -hmm. And then the portfolio expands, because you are able to take one use case, one problem, solve it in the right way. People see value and impact. And then you know you start growing along with it. So now we started off with just being in the shell of e-commerce, and now uh, you know you've gone into the and you know, kind of embedded into the matrix world of um, uh, the core retail as well, mm -hmm. where product managers. You know we actually just started our uh, in-club product management team only last year, right? Mm -hmm. um, until until uh, you know uh, last year we only had it for membership, marketing, and e-commerce. Those were the unmobile, right? And then the core, you know, now we have product managers who are solving backroom, people who are solving navigation in club, people who are solving, uh, you know, inventory management, restocking, a lot of very cool, innovative problems uh, in, a very in, a, in a very innovative way. Yeah? When you say most of the services here are the products like uh, Adobe Creative, the Photoshop has moved from years, yearly subscriptions to like monthly subscriptions, and even Amazon has this monthly subscriptions. Have you ever thought that that Amazon Prime doesn't have monthly, does, do, yeah, it, does. does it? Okay. Yeah, it's $9 per month. Okay. Uh, we've thought about it. Uh, I'll just say that we decided not to go in that direction. Yeah. I cannot divulge a lot of details, okay. um, but yeah, we've thought about it in the past, and this was a long time back. It, was that a hard problem to solve? Because, like, on one hand, hundred dollars. So, so I think I think we actually solved a different problem. You know, if you see the reason people want to go for monthly subscription is because they're not confident on the value that you get from it, right? If you can, if you can uh, drive, solve that problem of membership value with human nutrition and a number of other things. We actually just launched Sam's Travel, an experience site, like four weeks back. My team worked on it. So if you go to samsclub.com, you know, you see Sam's Travel and you could, so we actually are helping members save like 20, 30% on hotel booking, car rentals, uh, you know, cruise and events and, you know, 
Disney World tickets, which is not discounted anywhere, right? So if you are able to solve that, you know, in multiple different ways, and what we have done is just very early days, and that's all I can say at this point of time. Yeah. But if you are able to solve for membership value, then you don't need to go down the monthly subscription route because then you are making your brand relevant for members on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Yeah. Uh, for all 360 days. What I want to understand is like there's like two phases of onboarding here, right? One is before they became a Costco mem um, like yeah. member. Yeah. Remember? Like yeah. after they became a member, they have this watchers and everything, the gift coupons and everything. How do you entice customers in actually buying the membership? Like, how are you planning on solving that? Well, that's a that's a different problem which I didn't talk here. That's a membership acquisition problem. Uh, I would say we are doing it in multiple different ways. I will say this that we have not cracked the code fully on that yet, right? We are still working on the problem. Um, let me stop, pause at that. Uh, yeah, you know, we'll yeah. be, we'll, you know, maybe for a later session, once we feel comfortable that we have really solved the problem, I'd be willing to talk about it. Thank you.